Welcome, welcome, welcome all. Welcome one and all on this beautiful Sunday. I hope it is as gorgeous in your neck of the woods as it is in mine. Uh, I know you can't, uh, you know, get a full sense of it uh, in the Revelers Hour studio that I'm occupying, but it is absolutely beautiful um, outside. Uh, I hope uh, those of you participating, uh, and I can see that many of you do have uh, internet access uh, outside. Uh, I'm hugely jealous of uh, all of you uh, who have managed that, and uh, you know, big ups uh, to the patio set um, in the mix. Uh, naturally, this being a gorgeous summer sunny day, um, we're tasting some you know dense, meaty red wines. You know, just planned it perfectly. Um, but I, I will say that um, you know Malbec is one of those topics that uh, I took on. Um, you know, as much for the sake of acknowledging the ubiquity of this wine, you know, Malbec is a hugely successful brand in as much as it is a individualized grape varietal. Um, and uh, I have to say that I have been, you know, pleasantly surprised and beguiled and enchanted uh, by all there is to learn about Malbec um, and by the wines themselves, which um, are, uh, you, know, you know, big and bold and, you know, kind of gamey and meaty and herbal. Um, but, you know, strangely elegant and, and, and that uh, are, are changing, um, especially in Argentina and the Argentine wine scene. Um, I'm excited uh, to dive into uh, with you all. Um, just to address uh, the omnipresent question about what to open when, um, I will say that we have two wines in the mix here for the sake of those of you who provisioned through the restaurant. Thank you. Um, uh, we have, uh, as part of the two-pack cohort, uh, and then one of two... Um, Argentine Reds, uh, you're going to either have the Valio uh, Aggie, um, uh, which sees some oak, uh, is a little different than the one I have here. This is uh, volume number two, uh, Zorzal, Zorzal, which is just kind of fun to say, you know, I feel like Zorro there, um, or, you know, men on film, three snaps in a Z formation. Uh, but uh, this is a slightly more elegant uh, kind of wine, um, but uh, nonetheless representative of what's happening today in Argentina in a really um, dynamic and fun way. Uh, at any rate, um, we're going to go from uh, France, from uh, the European model, um, the uh, birthplace of Malbec, as it were, and as you will learn more about um, in uh, the succeeding uh, lesson. Um, and then we're going to uh, uh, do the Argentine uh, wine thereafter. So from old uh, to new world um, will be our, our progression. Um, typically, when I'm tasting at home, I like to start with a lighter wine and then move into a bigger one. Um, so, you know, you can gauge that in many different ways, uh, alcohol uh, being the easiest. So, you know, give the back of the bottle um, a look. Um, you know, uh, my cohort here uh, says we're at 12 and percent alcohol, um, which is, you know, um, not uncommon for a lot of old world um, red wines, uh, especially from, you know, slightly cooler regions and, and we'll explore that for the sake of core. Um, and uh, the Malbec, um, is at 13.5, which is actually remarkably restrained by Malbec standards. You know, typically these are wines that, you know, are, um, you know, sitting around 14% alcohol. This is a, another Malbec I brought to the party um, that I'll talk about later. This one's sitting at, at 14, but, you know, you get up to 15% um, and people, you know, the market, they like that. You know, people like the fullness of these wines. Um, and to some extent, a producer like uh, Zarzal, you know, they are, you know, operating, um, you know, kind of more in the parlance of cohort than they are traditional um, or, or kind of uh, what has become to be associated with uh, Argentina and its Malbecs in the modern era. Um, without further ado, uh, welcome uh, one and all. We're going to kick off uh, the lesson uh, here. I'm thrilled to host you all every week. Um, I find myself taking comfort um, in this routine, um, and I hope you all uh, feel uh, the same way. Um, we're going to come to uh, the shameless self-promotion portion of uh, proceedings here. And uh, on this front, um, we have uh, much to recommend. Uh, first and foremost, this Thursday, um, if you live in the DMV, um, we're going to be hosting a, a fundraiser for Campaign Zero. Uh, Campaign Zero uh, is a uh, movement uh, started by uh, some activists associated with Black Lives Matters. Uh, it's really about 
um, uh, kind of uh, policing reform. And uh, the zero there refers to um, zero deaths due to um, you know, uh, policing uh, practices um, in the United States. And uh, they recommend all sorts of uh, reforms. Uh, excitingly enough, uh, Cory Booker, Booker is going to uh, introduce legislation this Monday um, that um, is very consistent with the kinds of recommendations they make. Um, I feel like, you know, we want to put our money where our mouth is. Um, so all sales from uh, Tale of Goat on Thursday uh, will go to uh, Campaign uh, Zero. And at Revelers Hour throughout the week, we'll be selling sandwiches. All sales from uh, the sandwiches uh, will go to Campaign Zero as well. Um, we are really at the heart of this political moment in D.C., and we're proud that many of our servers, uh, many of our, uh, you know, Cooks have participated uh, in protests this week, um, and we want to take action uh, and support them. Uh, incidentally, uh, we're particularly excited to see on the nightly news a tail up goat hat um, in the crowd at a protest, which is uh, a wonderful segue because um, we have uh, merch. Um, I'm very excited to report that uh, the one that only, uh, Andrew Rutledge, it is his birthday, happy birthday, Andrew, uh, has designed some merch. Uh, he has designed some merch, not only for Revelers Hour, but specifically for Tail Up Goat Wine School. Uh, this is uh, the inaugural shirt, and uh, big ups to Janice for compiling uh, some quotes uh, for the sake of, uh, uh, you know, kind of building out merchandise, but this is the um, Flutes Are Bogus, um, I think, I think there's another, there's another image on the backside, but you can get a sense of what the backside of this looks like. I'm doing the worst job ever in showing off the merch, but this is the Champagne Flutes Are Bogus, um, uh, t-shirt, uh, from your friends at, uh, Tail Goat. So, uh, check that out, Sarah. We'll include, uh, the link, uh, in, uh, our chat, uh, for you all to follow, uh, as you see fit. Um, Equally excited uh, to have another content stream for those of you that can't wait a full week. Uh, join us Thursday for Flying Blind. Uh, those wines um, are available through the Revelers Hour site. That is our regular blind tasting series hosted by uh, none other than uh, Zoe Nystrom. Uh, they run me uh, through uh, the uh, ringer for the sake of tasting wine blind. I'm consistently batting 500. Uh, so uh, join up, see um, if you can do better than uh, what have I, I've established as the, you know, 500 Mendoza line uh, for the sake of wine tasting. Uh, without further ado, uh, we're going to move on to the matter at hand, which is um, Melbeck. Um, uh, and uh, thrilled to talk all about it. Um, as always, have a bit of verse. Um, and uh, we're going to kick it Argentine. Um, I was a, a Latin American history major, and I love a lot of Latin American verse. Um, and naturally, uh, Borges um, in the mix, uh, Jorge Luis Borges. Um, his writing is kind of outside of time, so, you know, it's hard to say that it's not topical because it's kind of always topical uh, with Borges, uh, which I, I love about him. Um, and uh, this is uh, his uh, bit of verse um, just to uh, kick things off. Um, and uh, just give me one moment here, and I'll have that for you all. But uh, this is a poem uh, translated from the original Spanish uh, called Compass. All things are words belonging to that language in which someone or something, night and day, writes down the infant babble that is, per se, the history of the world. And in that hodgepodge, both Rome and Carthage, he and you and I, my life that I don't grasp, this painful load of being riddle, randomness or code, and all of Babel's gibberish stream by. Behind the name is that which has no name. Today I have felt its shadow gravitate in this blue needle in its trembling sweep, casting its influence toward the farthest straight, with something of a clock uh, glimpsed in a dream and something of a bird that stirs in its sleep. Love Borges, love Borges. Um, uh, at any rate, um, uh, Malbec um, is a, a truly fascinating grape and its reach extends um, you know, around the world. Um, we are talking about Malbec and we will talk about its French origins, but we are devoting a class to it because it has come to prominence in Argentina and it because has become, you know, this hugely successful global brand. So it's this grape that has had this wonderful, you know, kind of uh, rebirth and renaissance in, um, you know, uh, the former colonies in a way that I find hugely uh, fascinating. And in as much as it is um, traditionally a French varietal, um, it is very much Argentina's own. Um, at this point. Um, and I think, you know, to the extent that people 
um, associate Malbec with anywhere, they associate it with uh, Argentina, which is really cool. Um, I have a bit of overwrought prose here. Uh, I love a little bit of overwrought prose. Uh, this is from uh, Pablo Lacoste. The Argentine government has spent a good deal of money uh, promoting its wine industry, promoting Malbec by extension. Uh, and uh, they, um, I think, gave Pablo a little bit of money to extol the virtues in the history, the unique history of Malbec. And uh, he, um, you know, kind of uh, went uh, to 11. So this is, you know, um, prose about Malbec's history that goes to 11 in kind of a, a fun uh, way. So speaking about Malbec um, and its history, he says, it is a journey full of vitality and dramatic tension marked by human passions, the power struggles and utopias, the victories and defeats, kings and nobles, Templars and musketeers, soldiers and Marines, British, French, Spanish, and other nations' forces all played their part on an uncertain path with stretches of darkness and silence, alternating with those of brightness and sounds of music and joy. To truly understand the success of this great, all this must be taken into consideration since Malbec is embedded in world history. You thought you were just drinking cheap supermarket wine. It turns out you're drinking world history, Heidi. Um, at any rate, um, I, I love that. And, and I'm fond of saying, uh, especially in the context of, of teaching um, you know, our, our servers here, that to the extent that you dig deeply enough and you study wine history, um, passionately enough, you are really studying the history of, of, of Western civilization. It is a very Western perspective, and it's important to note the limitations of that perspective. But um, if you dig deeply enough, you can understand, you know, really profound truths, not just about what's in the glass, but um, about the way, um, you know, we as a species, you know, came to, um, you know, uh, develop our civilizations uh, over time. And I think that's worth you know, celebrating uh, and exploring in a really fun way. Um, so uh, Malbec, um, such as it is, uh, has its origins in overrock prose, but uh, the grape itself was born in a region called uh, Cahor. Um, and uh, that is where our first wine is from. Cahor um, sits kind of um, at this crossroads. So uh, you are on a tributary of the Garonne. Um, so uh, the Garonne is one of two rivers, uh, the Garonne and the Dordogne, uh, that form the Gironde estuary. Uh, it's maddening, all these river names that form an estuary of a different name, uh, but you're basically dealing with um, upstream from Bordeaux. Uh, but historically, Cahors is actually more um, significant in the Roman era and into the early mid Middle Ages than uh, Bordeaux itself was. And um, the grape we now know as uh, Malbec uh, was uh, and is the cross of two ancient and uh, highly esoteric varietals, one being prunellard. Uh, the root there comes from prune, um, and it, it's thought that its, its flavors are reminiscent of prunes, which are not unlike the fruit flavors a lot of people ascribe to Malbec itself. And that grape has its origins in southwestern France. And another grape, uh, which is even more fascinating in my mind, called uh, Magdalene Noir de Chirance. Magdalene Noir de Chirance has its origins much further north in Normandy, uh, which is a cider country in the modern era, but back in the early Middle Ages, in the, in the uh, you know, 10th, 11th, 12th century, was uh, sufficiently warm to, um, you know, grow grapes to make wine. Um, uh, Magdalene Noir de Chirance, um, for those of you that were paying attention many moons ago during our Bordeaux lesson, is one of the parents of, wait for it, drumroll, uh, Merlot. Um, and so uh, it just so happens that Malbec and um, Merlot are half-siblings, which I find fascinating. Um, at any rate, the wines of this region core um, were famous um, uh, in the latter days of uh, the Roman era, uh, but they're hugely famous um, stretching into uh, the 11th and 12th century. Um, they were celebrated by Henry, Henry Plantagenet. Uh, he married Eleanor of Aquitaine um, and uh, became Henry III, but he praised what he called the dark wines of Gaur. And um, those of you looking in your glass of Gaur at the moment, I uh, can get a sense of that darkness. They call it the, the black wine of Cahors. Um, now, uh, there's quite a bit of historical um, and modern scholarly speculation about whether the grape he was talking about was Malbec um, or not. The first published uh, mention of Malbec is actually under a different name, uh, which is Co. Uh, C, uh, O with a little chapeau, and T, Co. Um, uh, the first published mention dates to the late 18th century. Um, the synonym Malbec um, is really fascinating. Um, uh, the grape itself um, was so widespread throughout France and spread so widely from its, its home base um, that um, it has anywhere from 400 to 
well over a thousand uh, different synonyms, um, which I find uh, hugely fascinating. Um, Malbec in particular um, has a lot of different um, etymologies depending on who you, you, uh, you know, pay attention to. My favorite is that um, there is a Hungarian um, Johnny Appleseed figure who um, promoted Malbec throughout France and um, uh, Malbec was named after him, his name Malbec. Uh, there's like zero, that's, that's definitely apocryphal. There's not much scholarly evidence to indicate that Malbec was ever a Hungarian surname or that this guy ever existed to give his name to the grape. But it's, it's a fun story uh, nonetheless. There's another um, uh, theory that um, Malbec as a grape was always used as a blending agent. And uh, the, the French Malbec means um, uh, kind of bad beak. Um, which is thought to derive from kind of bad mouth or, or bitter astringent taste. Um, and, and that's one other uh, kind of popularized uh, notion for the sake of its origins. Uh, the, the one that um, is probably correct, uh, Jancis Robinson, um, who is, is one of the foremost scholars on, on this type of thing, says that um, it takes its name from a um, merchant in Bordeaux who popularized the grape at the tail end of the 18th century. But I, I rather like the Hungarian apple seed, Johnny Appleseed version. So, you know, let's just go with that one. Um, you know, sometimes the, you know, the fun fiction is better than, you know, the, the whole truth, especially when it comes to, you know, drinking stories. Um, at any rate, um, Malbec came from Cahors, landed in Bordeaux. Uh, it is one of six allowable varietals in Bordeaux. And actually, up until um, the mid 20th century was a very important varietal in a lot of Bordeaux wines. Um, people talk about traditional Bordeaux blends and they're usually referring to the Troika, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and Merlot, but it should be said uh, that Malbec, Petit Bordeaux, and Carmenier can go into the mix as well. Um, Malbec uh, had quite a foothold in Bordeaux proper until 1956, um, which was the coldest winter on record since uh, the early 18th century. Uh, there's a, a series of disastrous frosts um, uh, Malbec in particular is not very cold hardy, um, uh, especially early in its growth cycle, and um, a lot of the vines died and were replaced uh, by other varietals. Uh, Corho suffered the same, uh, Cohor rather, suffered the same fate, but for whatever reason, um, the grape uh, persisted and, and remained uh, the major varietal there, such that into the modern era, uh, by law, the wines of Cohor must contain 70% Malbec. Which brings us to the matter at hand, our core. So let's taste some fucking wine. Um, uh, we've got this uh, in the glass. Uh, let's taste through it. Um, color is significant for the sake of Malbec. Should be said, um, uh, Malbec readily identifiable by its magenta rim. Magenta rim, for those of you playing along at home. Um, so uh, it is one of those wines that, you know, if you are in a blind tasting context, um, color can be hugely indicative. And uh, you really get that on this cohort. Um, you know, it has this like really bright, vivid color that not a lot of uh, red wines give off. Um, what I love about this wine um, is the aromatic uh, dimension of it. This is not a wine that sees any oak. Um, the initial fermentation happens in ancient cement uh, vats, and, and we'll talk about that a little later in the context of um, Argentine uh, contemporary winemaking, but it sees a little bit of neutral oak to soften things up thereafter, uh, but it's hugely aromatic. It's not aromatic in a loads of baking spice, um, new oak, vanilla uh, kind of way. Uh, it's hugely aromatic in this like daily, you know, gamey steak jus um, kind of way uh, that I find, you know, hugely enthralling. Um, also something like, for me, kind of uh, dusty um, and, you know, slaty and graphite um, about this wine uh, in, in a way that, you know, I, I find um, really, really fascinating. And, and I love to live in that, you know, kind of more savory world when it comes to wine. You know, this is a wine that has fruit, but what fruit it has leans more toward the kind of like tart, you know, underripe berry uh, side of the ledger. The much more kind of interesting descriptors I find are, you know, those secondary and tertiary dimensions uh, of flavor uh, for the sake of this one. Ah, wunderbar. I just wish I had steak to go with it. Um, just to, you know, talk about what makes this particular wine. So this comes from Clos Sigur. Um, many generations uh, in the same family, uh, the estate dates back uh, several centuries. Um, I'm going to pull up the map of Cahor uh, once more, because um, I can show you where exactly this particular estate lies. So uh, this blue dot here uh, indicates the estate, and that is significant because um, the defining feature of Cahor is the river Lot, which is the uh, tributary of the Garonne, 
And traditionally, the black wines of Gore um, were from vineyards closer to uh, the river itself. Um, anytime you get closer to a river, uh, the soils are going to be heavier and they're going to be more fertile, um, which sounds like a good thing, but for the sake of wine, tends to produce um, dense, uh, fuller-bodied wines, but uh, typically less characterful uh, ones. Um, this estate is about as far as you can get from the river and still be in the domain, and that's significant because it's on uh, what the locals call the Cause, that's C A U S S E, which is an uplifted limestone seabed. And uh, that limestone, um, which is a very basic soil, tends to give more acidic, uh, brighter, um, you know, elegant, uh, structured kinds of wines. And you're at elevation well above the river a lot here. And because that, you know, you're very late ripening, very long growing season, you know, harvest might be at the end of October here, which given how far south you are in France is pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, even, you know, given the fact that Malbec is a, a very late ripening grape. Um, Cahors, um, it should be said, cartoonishly beautiful. Um, you know, we're going to deal with two um, winemaking regions that are um, cartoonishly beautiful for the sake of today's lesson. Um, and it has this like land that time forgot quality to it. Um, it was, uh, you know, a major trading route. Uh, the river itself was. This is Gilles, a winemaker, um, in his cellar, um, which dates back many centuries. Um, and uh, you know, it was along major trade routes. Uh, it was along a pilgrimage route to um, the Cathedral of St. James. So it was actually along um, the Camino de Santiago, which we talked about a couple lessons ago. Um, and, you know, this is one of those wines that truly is timeless. It is held back uh, for two years. It is unfined and unfiltered. Um, uh, he holds it back um, so that he can um, not filter. So um, classically, if you're just leaving a wine uh, and settling it on the fine leaves, it takes about two years for the wine to settle enough that you can then rack it off without filtering and produce something that's shelf stable. So he truly does it the old way. Um, and these are six year old vines. He makes a separate crew um, that we actually have for sale. Um, that is from 80 plus year old vines. Um, uh, these are 40 year old vines. They look like they're from the basement of time, which I love. You can see the limestone uh, in the soil. This is an old outbuilding. Uh, you'll find these scattered across wineries throughout the old world. You know, it's just a, a place for uh, people to, you know, rest their head and escape the sun. Um, you know, this is, is one of those wines that, you know, really hasn't changed um, for the sake of uh, its production. Um, in you know, a, a fabulous, you know, almost retrograde, you know, reactionary uh, kind of way. Um, but I love that about it. And, and it tastes, you know, traditional and, and wholesome. Um, and I think there's something like lovably old fashioned about it. And it, I think it also confounds this picture that we have of Malbec as this like jammy fruit punch, jungle juicy kind of thing from, you know, the lowest supermarket aisle. You know, this is, this is not that. But it's still, you know, wildly inexpensive um, in, in a way that, you know, is, is, is always worth uh, celebrating. Um, Sarah Thompson, uh, I'm going to unmute you uh, before um, I, I, call, I call you to comment or, or holler questions at me. Uh, what do you have from the commentary for the sake of this particular offering? Well, first of all, your one-offs are, uh, you know, you're about to make a lot of t-shirts from this conversation. Okay. <laughs> that's how we, that's how we make all our money, Sarah. <laughs> the the t-shirt sales. Yes, exactly. You, you and your basement of time over there. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are, though, privately getting schooled on our pronunciation of, of Kaor. Oh, it, thank you. It is silent. Kaor, and it's, it's two syllables, not, it should be two syllables, not one. Yeah. Kaor, thank, thank you. Um, <laughs> you said that uh, I'm much more qualified to talk Malbec as it exists in Argentina uh, linguistically than I am Cahor as it exists in France. You know, I, I took some Spanish, but, you know, you could probably guess how much French I took in school. <laughs> Same. <laughs> yeah. Um, people want to know whether all Cahor wine is Malbec or what's the deal? What's the percentage? Yeah, by law, um, it is 70% uh, Malbec. Um, you will find Tanat in the mix. So this one has 5% Tanat in the mix. Uh, Tanat is a Basque grape, um, uh, fascinatingly enough. So um, you're approaching um, Basque country, and, and, and France has Basque country, Uruguay, on the, on the other side of the Pyrenees um, from uh, Spanish Basque country. Um, and then there is, shit, what else can you throw in the mix? You can throw in, 
I think you throw oh, Merlot. You can throw another red grape in the mix that I'm forgetting. Um, but by law, um, um, uh, Co. They actually don't call it Malbec in 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 Cahors. They either call it um, uh, Co. Uh, Co. or Ox uh, which is hugely um, maddening because Ox uh, refers to another uh, grape in France, which is a white grape predominant in Alsace, which is genetically identical to Pinot Blanc. So there's just like a lot of madness there uh, linguistically. But um, it is by law um, predominantly um, Malbec, but not exclusively Malbec. They grow other things there. So actually, um, Closigur makes this really cool um, pet nat from Wasak, um, but they can't label it Cahor because it doesn't conform to what, you know, they think of as, as the wines from this particular corner of France. And I know we're not talking Bordeaux today, but Christian does want to know what Malbec lends to Bordeaux reds. Oh, uh, great. Yeah, it's a great question, um, or ex excellent question in the far lens of our, our uh, t-shirts. Um, uh, 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 body, structure, um, it's one of those, put the lead in the pencil um, of the wines thing. Um, and very often, um, you know, before uh, people got really worked up about, you know, single estate wines, the merchants of Bordeaux would... Um, import Malbec from Cahors, which is further south, um, to add to their wines to lend color um, and to lend structure. Um, so that's that's what you get out of it. And um, you know, just you know, getting ahead of the global warming questions, you know, it could be that you know, as Bordeaux warms up, um, Malbec, a later ripening grape than the uh, uh, traditional Bordeaux Troika, um, will you know reemerge. Um, and, and, and as frost hopefully becomes less of an issue, late frost becomes less of an issue in Bordeaux, you know, uh, Malbec, uh, Petit Bordeaux in particular, could reemerge in the region um, as, as grapes that are driving blends as opposed to grapes that just occasionally put lead in the pencil of, of these blends. Great. Um, so uh, shifting gears um, and, and moving to, you know, this, this strange um, you know, uh, patterns of migration. And, and I, I will say, um, you know, migration studies, um, uh, you know, the history of trade, hugely fascinating, underexplored, um, and, you know, very significant for the sake of food um, and, and wine. You know, we are in the Americas, you know, all mashups, you know, um, you know, uh, none of us, you know, except for, you know, the, the small percentage that, you know, actually are from here and came across a land bridge, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, um, you know, are, are, you know, from here for many generations in, in, in a broader sense. Um, Argentina is, you know, very much like America, a uh, land of immigrants. Um, the, you know, the, the composition is a little different. In Argentina, it was, you know, fewer gringos. So there were, there were some English uh, that came to Argentina, but it was, it was largely uh, Spanish first and then um, significantly in the 19th and, and 20, early 20th century, um, uh, Italian. Um, and and Argent, Argentina, especially in Buenos Aires, um, you know, the Porteño dialect comes as much from Italian as it does from, from Spanish. And uh, there's a really fascinating, I took a lot of Argentine history, but they're really fascinating, like parallel um, trajectories for Argentina and the United States throughout their history until you hit, you know, um, World War I. It's just like famous maxim uh, from an uh, Argentine president, gobernar es poblar, so to govern is to populate. So you get a sense of, you know, the integral role that immigration has played um, in the country. Um, at any rate, you know, Malbec comes to Argentina um, the same way a lot of grapes come to uh, uh, the New World. And, and, and this is through their effort to, um, you know, kind of uh, celebrate wine in their own way and differentiate themselves from their former colonial masters. So, um, the kind of uh, father, the forefather of the Malbec movement in Argentina is this hugely uh, fascinating figure named uh, Domingo Faustino Sarmiento. Sarmiento is um, this larger than life figure, hugely significant for the sake of Argentine history, um, South American history, uh, global history, if, if you dig deeply enough. A uh, very profound, beautiful writer in Castilian Spanish, um, but he uh, spent a lot of his life in exile in Chile. Um, because uh, in the earlier part of his life, he eventually became uh, president of Argentina. Uh, but in the uh, um, uh, you know, 1840s, 1850s, um, Argentina was ruled over by a dictator named Rosas. And Sarmiento fled to Santiago, Chile, across the Andes um, from Argentina. Um, and uh, because uh, he um, reviled uh, Rosas and he had these you know, very Republican 
democratic uh, progressive ideas about what he wanted for his state that he ultimately was able to um, popularize and, and is celebrated to, to uh, celebrated for to this day. Um, but at that time, um, he was in uh, Santiago and uh, the Chileans themselves were trying to differentiate themselves from their former um, Spanish colonial masters. And um, they uh, wanted to promote their own wine industry. Uh, and they had all these Spanish grapes they're working with, um, uh, chiefly a grape called Pais, um, which is still used to make wine um, in Chile to this day, a wine called Pipeño that's really cool and hopefully will be the subject of another wine class. But at any rate, they were like, you know, we want to move away from that whole Spanish thing um, and, you know, we want to innovate. And, you know, for them, the model, the archetype was France. And so uh, they brought in uh, French agronomists and French grapes, chiefly on um, this, you know, kind of um, really uh, important figure named um, uh, Michel uh, Pouget, who's a French agronomist, uh, first in Santiago, and they said, we're going to found schools, these Quinta Normales, um, uh, and we're going to, you know, found them uh, according to the French model. So these are agricultural schools um, that, you know, during uh, the 18th century Renaissance in France had become popular for the sake of promoting best practices for our agriculture um, and for viticulture. And uh, the Chileans first in Santiago, you know, uh, established one and us, um, and then, you know, you have this, this figure Sarmiento that says, I want the same for Argentina. So he crosses the Andes. Um, uh, Santiago, Chile is, is like 50 miles from Mendoza, which is still to this day, the center of Argentine winemaking, but you have to cross a 20,000 foot Andean ridge to get there. Um, and, um, you know, uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a longer trip than you might imagine, given, given how close they are as the crow flies. Uh, but uh, eventually he makes his way to Mendoza and founds his own Quinta Normal. Um, and uh, the local legislature establishes uh, this school with me, the same Michel Poget um, as um, the kind of guiding intellectual light on April 17th, 1853. Uh, and to this day, Argentina and Incoor, they celebrate April 17th as World Malbec Day. Uh, raise the roof for World Malbec Day. Certain we, we missed World Malbec Day, but at any rate, um, uh, Mendoza um, is is hugely fascinating, and Malbec did really well there um, for a, a variety of reasons. So, um, you know, first and foremost, I think it's important to acknowledge that we are dealing with a cartoonishly beautiful um, place. We are in the foothills of the Andes. Um, this is uh, these are the vineyards of Zorzal. That's the one I'm drinking. Um, it is in the same district in the same subregion, in the same kind of sub sub region as um, the, um, the first wine that we sold um, uh, as the, the Valle Aggie. So this is the, could be the view uh, from those vineyards as well. Those are the snow-capped Andes. You know, it's just stupidly beautiful. Um, you know, it's just a place you wanna, you know, give up your quarantine life in DC and drive down to if that was an option. Um, you know, not to, you know, feed anyone with, with ideas. But um, at any rate, um, you are on the east side of uh, the Andes, and that's significant because weather patterns move west to east, and that puts you in a rain shadow. Um, so if you can see this map, you know, east side of the Andes, um, you're essentially in a desert. Um, they get about eight inches of rain a year, which uh, makes it honest to God desert. Uh, the threshold for desert is 10 inches of rain a year. Um, how do they grow grapes? You know, vines are, are famously... Um, hardy, and you know they don't need a lot of water, but they need more than than that. Um, uh, they do that through irrigation. They do that through snowmelt. So irrigation is essential uh, to the winemaking here. Although occasionally they can dry farm, but irrigation and water rights, um, you know, like in Australia, are hugely significant to the winemaking industry. Um, that makes it a very auspicious region, though, um, because it's so dry. Um, they can grow and ripen almost anything. And there's like zero disease pressure. Um, uh, so they can work with a grape like Malbec that is otherwise a little finicky um, if you don't treat it right, especially early in the growing season. And then it can make these like really spectacular wines out of it. And uh, they did that through uh, the modern era in quantity, um, but they didn't really make wine in quality until the 80s. And at that point you had, you know, these, um, you know, transformational figures in the Argentine industry like uh, Zucardi and Catino Zapata. And uh, they, really looked at what was happening elsewhere in the new world in places like California um, in particular. And they said, you know, look, you know, these uh, new world wine regions, um, you know, they, you know, have, have grown grapes for a long time, but they are starting to make wines that can rival, um, you know, the great wines in Europe. And they said, you know, we should be doing the same thing. And um, honestly, the, the rest is history. And, and Malbec really took off 
Um, and I, I found it fascinating that they didn't really, they created their own brand. They didn't really have to adopt someone else's. And that's, that to me says something about the innateness of um, how well Malbec was suited to this terroir. So, you know, what does Malbec do in Argentina that maybe it doesn't do um, elsewhere quite as well? Well, you have a thicker skin grape, but you have a very sunny region. And because you're getting so much sun, you see this like great physiological development of the fruit. And, you know, these tannins that would be harsh and austere in other places tend to break down in a way that gives these wines this velvety softness. And, you know, Malbec has this really large ripening window. Um, there are some grapes like, um, like Merlot um, or, or, you know, Pinot at times. Uh, if you've ever seen like the Eddie Izzard pear, you know, skit about ripening, you know, they just like have this like narrow window. And if you don't like pick them, then they're just, you know, they're going to fall apart. You know, they're going to just go like go overripe and give up the ghost. It'll be all over. Um, Malbec doesn't work that way. Malbec, like you could, you know, give it all the hang time in the world. It'd be fine, you know, and it's just about what, what Malbec do you want to make? Now, um, you know, it works that way in a drier environment. Um, but, um, you know, it doesn't, you know, work that way in, in an environment, you know, that's not quite as auspicious or, or dry, uh, as, as Argentina. Um, you know, so that's, you know, the, the core truth of, of what is special about this, this grape in this region. And then, um, well, let's taste some fucking wine first. Uh, uh, I, I've talked enough, um, but it, it's, it's really, really fascinating place. So, um, uh, uh, let's, Thompson, let's, let's feed it over to the commentariat because I did a terrible job of saving wine for the sake of this lesson uh, on the value. Uh, it should be said the value Aggie um, comes from a really cool bloke uh, named uh, Jose Lavalio Balbo. Um, in the Spanish parlance, um, his name, so like if he was a gringo, his name would be Jose Lavalio. Um, they append the mother's surname to the father's surname. So his mother's surname is Balbo. Um, his mother, total badass, um, was one of the first women credentialed as a, um, you know, winemaker um, in Mendoza, um, still in, like, in very involved in her own estate's winemaking to this day, and also has become a congresswoman um, in Mendoza. Um, and uh, at any rate, uh, this is his, the Valio is his side project. Um, it sees 40% new oak. Um, Malbec is a grape that can wear new oak well. I think in the 80s, you had this influx of consultants, or the 90s, more, more in the 90s. You had this influx of consultants to Argentina who saw that, A, this place is preposterously beautiful. Like, who, would, who wouldn't want to hang and eat steak and chimichurri and drink Malbec there? Um, but also, B, that, um, you know, they were very much working in this, like, Michel Roland, Paul Hobbs, you know, you know kind of uh, universe of, you know, the riper, the better. You know, so they were, like, after all the Robert Parker points, and they were throwing new oak at a grape that may or may not have needed it already. Uh, people have pulled back from that. And, you know, one of my favorite takeaways from this particular lesson has been that, you know, these wines are becoming a lot fresher. Um, you know, I don't want to make blanket statements against new oak, though. You know, I think oak can, you know, if you wear it well, be like a really fun accent. And, and I think, you know, the value gives you a sense of that. You know, the value is closer to Malbec as most people imagine it, but um, it is nonetheless elegant in a really awesome way. So I, I don't know, uh, Thompson, if you want to throw out, you know, some, for folks that do have that wine, you know, how would you guys differentiate it from, uh, you know, the, the cohort uh, that we were previously drinking? Thompson, what are you drinking at home? I have the Valio. Well, come on. How would you differentiate it? I haven't gotten to it yet. Well, how would your parents? Come on, let's see your folks. Let's have your folks chime in. I'm being handed glasses. Give me a second. Oh, nice. Um, so it should be said, um, this particular wine is from uh, a subzone of uh, Mendoza. So Mendoza is the province of Argentina. Um, it is a beautiful, beautiful city. Uh, one of the most beautiful wine cities in the world. Um, and it has sub-regions um, apart from, um, you know, the, the kind of larger province. So um, traditionally, or in and around Santa Rosa, those are some of like the oldest wineries. Um, they make wine at volume. Um, uh, in this region, uh, Lujan de Cuyo is a very old vines that start to creep up the mountains. And then you have the Valle Uco, about an hour or so south of Mendoza, which is 
where a lot of the most prestigious wines come from to this day. And uh, that is where both of um, the offerings that we're drinking uh, come from, both the Valio and the wine I'm drinking for the sake of the uh, Zorzal. Uh, both of those hail from a, a unique subregion of um, the Uco Valley, um, which itself is at a higher elevation than the rest of Mendoza. Um, they both come from this individual commune called uh, Gautavari, um, and that's in the north. Um, and itself, you have all of these alluvial outwashes. So alluvial is a, a geological term that just refers to the outwash of a river or a stream. Um, and uh, alluvial soils, uh, you know, tend to be, um, as they, as you go kind of closer to the mountains, stonier, rockier, less fertile. As you get further down, they get heavier and more fertile. Um, you know, most of these estates are going to be higher up. Um, on the hill, uh, so to speak. And that's going to give you these like brighter, more precise uh, kinds of wines. And the Argentines are doing, they're really like terroir obsessed now when it comes to their Malbec. And they're wanting to understand the underpinnings of these individual vineyard sites in a more profound way. And, and because of that, they're wanting to manipulate the wine less. They're wanting to throw less oak at it because, you know, if you throw oak at a wine, and you're trying to understand vineyard influence, then you know, you're obscuring the fact uh, very often. And, and I find that really fascinating. So for the sake of Zor the Zorzal, it's uh, entirely concrete. Um, for the sake of the Valio, it's, it's comparatively judicious use of new oak uh, by Argentine standards. Uh, Sarah Thompson, um, give us your reflections on the Valio vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, um, the, co the cohort uh, that we were tasting. Yeah, it, it's a lot more, um jammy and has a lot more stewed fruit to it um i think it's true a couple of people are saying this on the chat as well that the the fruit presents itself as a bit sweeter which I think yeah. Makes sense. yeah and then you know it should be said the new oak influence there are a lot of chemical constituents in new oak that give you a perception of fullness and sweetness um you know they're they're not sugars as such so it says nothing about you know the um you know uh kind of empirical scientific amount of sugar in the wine. It says more about, you know, the way we perceive it. Um, I think, you know, with respect to the Zorzal, you know, I'm, I'm kind of excited about this wine because um, it doesn't see any new oak. Um, you get a sweetness of fruit. So the, the quality of fruit in this wine is very different than the quality of fruit in the Gore. Um, and it leans much more into that riper berry fruit. There's a lot more of like kind of like a ripe raspberry, um, you know, signature uh, to this wine. But it's still really bright and it's still not, you know, one note. Um, you know, I still get some of those like gamey, meaty, um, you know, um, kind of flavor profiles that I, I love about, I love about Malbec. And, you know, that comes from a couple of things. It comes from um, altitude, um, but, you know, that also comes from, um, you know, their decision about what kind of wine they want to make and when they want to harvest their fruit. And it should be said that um, in this region, they're altitude obsessed. So in Europe, um, the highest elevation vineyards max out at, you know, 1,500 feet typically. There are a few vineyards above that. You know, I was, I was looking at stats. Jancis Robinson, um, you know, said that, you know, 1640 was the upper limit. You know, there's never going to be like a true upper limit. You know, people are always pushing that. But, you know, uh, you know, you get to a certain elevation where, you know, grapes just don't reliably ripen in, in Europe. In, in Malbec, or in, in Argentina, you know, these vineyards are, they start at like 2,000 feet and up. Um, you know, both of these are probably like 2,500 to 3,000 feet of elevation. There are people making wine at like 5,000 feet and up. There are people pushing like even more extremes. And it's become very fashionable within the last five years in Argentina to like post the, like put the elevation on the label. Um, and, you know, it feels facile, but it does make for really interesting wine. It should be said that at higher altitudes, a few things happen. First of all, um, the higher you get, um, obviously, uh, the cooler it gets. So um, they say that like with every, I think with every 100 feet uh, meter elevation gain, or is it 1,000 Thompson? I think 1,000 1, meters. 1,000 meter of elevation gain equals like one degree lower of uh, temperature centigrade. Maybe it's 100. I don't know fucking know, but... That makes a big difference. That's a that's an exponential growth curve I'm talking about. But anyway, the higher you get, the cooler it gets. You get the idea. Uh, the relationship is the same. Um, uh, at, at any rate, um, and and you know that typically though has more to do with um, temperature swing 
than it does um, with, um, you know, a, a composite temperature. So it still gets really hot. It gets about as hot as it would on the valley floor in a lot of these places, but it gets way cooler at night. And, uh, the, you know, the, the wonky, nerdy wine term for that is diurnal shift. So if you're, you know, visiting winemaker friends in Argentina or elsewhere and you want to, you know, impress them, you can ask about the diurnal shift or, you know, say you're so impressed about that. But it's just a way of saying that the, the you know, difference between the daytime high and the nighttime low is really big. And uh, in, in Argentina, they have, like, some of the biggest uh, differences between that, you know, daytime high and nighttime low. And what that gives you is full ripeness in your fruit um, and development of those like riper fruiter flavors, but you're able to maintain acidity because the temperatures drop and it, it, it um, delays ripening. So it's not the case that, you know, your grapes are sprinting across the finish line for the sake of ripening. They're still, you know, kind of eking and you always want that eek. You know, good wine is all about extending that ripening window you know you want that kind of long slow maturation process you're always about that low and slow uh, for the sake of um, good wine and you know complex uh, fruit um, and you know I, I find that I find that really fascinating and really special um, about this region is the way that they've been able to unlock altitude um, as this variable um, in their grape growing uh, in winemaking, and it's something that they continue to dive, you know, really deep uh, into. And then, you know, this added piece that, you know, they have become more terroir obsessed um, in this region. And uh, so, you know, they're altitude obsessed, but increasingly um, they're looking at, you know, these various vineyards. And, and typically the composition is the same. Typically it's all alluvial outwash. So, you know, typically it's all these, fan, what's called an alluvial fan. Um, it's flood zone coming down from the Andes. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, um, you know, within that fan, you get a variety of different soil compositions. And, you know, for the sake of Mendoza, there's quite a bit of, um, of limestone. It's a little different than the ancient sea, seabed floor you see in Cahor. Um, a lot of it is kind of produced in situ through a series of chemical reactions around these larger stones in a way that makes for different kinds of wines. Um, but um, it gives you that, you know, um, influence of more basic soils in a really profound way. And, and for the sake of Malbec, that retains your acid. Um, that gives you kind of brightness in a wine that could be otherwise lacking it in a really fascinating way. Uh, Thompson, did you have uh, any more questions uh, for me uh, pursuant to uh, either the Zorzal or um, the volume, um, having compared those to the core? Um, not specifically to the wines that we're drinking, but a couple of questions in general. Um, yeah. we're, we're at about 100 meters. I was trying to do a little research. So oh, 100, 100 meters per, per degree. Uh, 0. 0.6 degrees Celsius. Oh, okay, okay. Meters right. per 100 meter rise, yeah. Oh, okay. But that doesn't take into account wind chill and stuff like that. We'll do more research. We'll send yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, there is a question about uh, why there's so much haterade around Malbec. It's like the new Merlot. Um, I think that's just because I think like, it's a, it's a bit of a haters going to hate thing. They've been like really successful uh, at building their brand. Um, and, you know, they have like stolen market share away from California Merlot. Um, you know, I think part of it too is about the fact that like on a large scale, a lot of the wines are heavily, heavy, heavily manipulated. Um, they're acidified universally across the board. Um, so it should be said that, you know, none, none of the wines that I've, I've recommended or are acidified as, as I know, but um, the process of acidifying wine in warmer climates is much more common than people commonly realize. Um, and that sounds really um, insidious, but it's as simple as adding um, typically tartaric acid um, in powdered form uh, to wine. Um, and people do that as a corrective because otherwise the wine would just be kind of whack and flat. Um, um, and it's a lot easier to make overripe wine and add a little tartaric acid than it is to make a wine that stands on its own two feet and has enough acid to, you know, be uh, balanced as such prior to release. Uh, part of the reason you see a lot of growers in Mendoza moving to the Uco Valley in these higher altitude sites is because they can make wines that are, are less manipulative. Um, uh, so, um, you know, I think people react against the manipulation. I think people react against, um, you know, the fact that it has been kind of an over-oaked wine. 
Um, I think people react against the fact that it just like descends into this, you know, Miomi Pino, like one look, you know, big fucking red place that lacks any, you know, um, expression of place. Um, and, and, and so, you know, I, I think those criticisms are justified to that end, but, you know, by the same token, I feel like Argentina suffers just like, just like Australia suffers from the success of these huge commercial brands. Argentina does as well. I don't think people realize how dynamic the wine scene is there on the ground because a lot of the more interesting smaller production artisanal wines don't make it here. You know, a lot of the wines that don't conform to that image of the $10, you know, low shelf, you know, kind of entry level Argentine Malbec, they don't make it here because it's not what people are interested in, you know? And, and so, you know, you have these artisanal producers that are trying to do something different than what people are used to out of Argentine Malbec or God forbid other grapes. And they're there, you know, there are a lot of like really interesting Argentine blends. Petite Verdot does really well. Cab uh, Bronc actually does really well in Mendoza. Um, uh, Tarantes, uh, which is a different Tarantes than the one in Spain, can be an interesting dynamic kind of wine. Um, you know, Bernarda is like a like Italian peasants wine, but if you, you know, treat it right, it could be, you know, wonderfully dynamic and fascinating. So, um, and then, and that's not to speak at all about old vine Pinot in Patagonia. So um, it, it's a much more, um, you know, dynamic wine scene that people give it credit for. But, you know, they've been a victim of their own success. They've been so successful at selling us, you know, um, you know $10 Malbec by the, you know, shipping container full um, that I, you know, sometimes those wines crowd out the, the more um, expressive, you know, um, ones that, you know, wine drinkers who care about a sense of place are, are, are would be interested in. Um, in another vein about Argentinian Malbecs, you often see um, that they're 100% Malbec and not a lot of blending varietals. Yeah. Um, but conversely with the core, you have mostly Malbec, but with a blending partner of, you know, Tanat and Merlot. Um, why are they not blending more in Argentina? That's, why? That's a, great, that's a great question. And that's something that I think a lot of people lament. Um, I, part of why they're not blending more is because people will pay more for 100% Malbec. Um, the uh, the grape itself has become so successful that you know consumers like the idea of varietal driven wine. Um, it doesn't matter that you could make a better wine if you added a little bit of Petit Verdot and Cab Franc. Um, you know, no one cares about that. You know, the idea of blends for some reason, you know, is gauche, is debased. Um, I, I think you know people are so varietally driven now in their wines that you know they don't like the idea that you know, something is, you know, somehow impure um, because there are multiple grapes in, in, in the mix. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a consumer trend more than a winemaker trend. I, I think, you know, most winemakers would say that, like, you know, if left to their own devices, they'd love to add a little Bernarda to their Malbec, you know, or, or it's a lot harder to find 100% Malbec that can, um, you know, fire on all cylinders um, and, you know, hit all, like, check all the boxes you wanted to than it is to, you know, maybe, you know, throw a little something in the mix just to soften things. Um, so um, I think that's more of a consumer thing than it is a, a winemaker driven thing. Speaking of consumer side things, um, where can people get some of these smaller production? Uh, Grand Cata. So Grand Cata, Grand Cata, Grand Cata. Those guys are awesome. Um, uh, you know, we haven't recommended them for the sake of, you know, provisioning for school. Um, you know, at the moment that's out of naked um, you know, economic interest for our own uh, survival, but um, that place is awesome. Um, Grand Cata is one of my favorite liquor stores in the city. Um, it is really awesome. The, it, it has this like narrative aspect, the way it's divided. So uh, Grand Cata is a liquor store founded by Argentine Uruguayan. Is there a Chilean or Uruguayan? Uh, fuck. Uh, anyway, uh, a couple of South American blokes. Um, on one side of the store, they have wine from uh, the, the South America. And then Uruguay, um, uh, Argentina, and Chile, uh, chiefly. And then on the other side of the store, they have wine from the former mother countries, uh, Portugal, um, uh, Italy, and Spain. Um, they refuse, have refused to, to carry French wine, which I think is sort of cool as fuck, because um, I like arbitrary constraints when it comes to wine lists and stuff like that. Um, they, they carry a little bit of French wine now. Um, and there obviously is a French imprint in Latin America, um, but neither here nor there historically. 
but it, it's an awesome, awesome um, store. Um, they have individualized relationships with a lot of growers and going there will, you know, totally upend what you think of South American wine. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's easy to poo-poo something that's new. I think a really important thing to understand about, you know, the wine world as it exists for us today is that, you know, you can't make broad generalizations about who can make wine. You know, it's such a global world. Um, you know, in the wine world, you know, you have, so like these guys in Argentina, this is three, three brothers making wine, you know, they will have worked harvest all over the world. And, and typically when you're learning your chops as a winemaker from, uh, you know, harvest is the most significant time. And, and, you know, that window in the new world, what Thompson's like August to September, October, you mm -hmm. know, uh, a lot of cellar rats, they'll work one harvest in the Northern hemisphere and then they'll jump to the, the Southern hemisphere and work another harvest. And people will do that for five years. Um, and so like the wine world is amazingly global. Um, and, you know, people are, much more intellectually curious than they ever have been. Um, and, and, you know, historically in Argentina, there was one barometer, Bordeaux. Like, they were looking at Bordeaux, and that was, like, the wine they wanted to make. That was, like, it. But, you know, the modern, like, the modern generation, you know, they're just as curious about what's happening in Georgian Amphora or with Vangin and Jura or with, you know, some, you know, dude in Australia, you know, making you know, pet mat, you know? So there's this like globalism to the wine nerd community that is really cool. And, and you know, there's this like wonderful lingua franca among cellar rats um, that, that's, that's really fun. And, and I think like to the extent that you like dive deep and spend time with wine people, it's really fun that way. And, and like in regions that aren't, um, you know, really like status conscious, um, you know, there's like a wonderful egalitarian egalitarianism about it too like argentina is like that in a really cool way um from what i read like chile doesn't have as much of that like chile is much more like oligarchical historically in terms of the influence of like moneyed like smaller numbers of families there's an awesome natural wine scene in chile that i'm sure is like wonderfully even handed in egalitarian but like smaller producers in lesser known regions um you know it's it's just like a really fun community and everybody you know is about like sharing the like joy of drinking wine. Um, can you talk about some Malbecs in the U.S. and also can you talk about the Malbec that you have sitting off to the side? People want to uh, know. That, that was, uh, thank you for that segue, Thompson. So, um, uh, so uh, Malbec in the U.S. Um, historically, there was a lot more. Um, it was one of the grapes originally introduced um, to um, California uh, post-Civil War. So I don't think people realize that like um, right after the Civil War. So a lot of people that came to uh, California um, uh, uh, to mine gold, you know, nobody found gold. Um, the people that made the most money were the people that were outfitting um, the people that were trying to find gold. But uh, people had to find, you know, something when they didn't find gold. And a lot of them actually started to grow grapes. So there was a huge wine industry um, in California after the Civil War. Um, and uh, actually the first varietally driven or the first uh, wine labeled uh, Cabernet Sauvignon in California as a, a, a varietal wine was actually labeled Cal Cab Sauv slash Merlot um, in indeterminate, um, uh, you know, quantities. So, um, you know, Malbec has always been an important part of that recipe, and that's consistent with its popularity in Bordeaux historically. Um, its fortunes have just waned. Um, you know, it, the same thing that happened in, in um, uh, France happened here, um, but, you know, on a larger scale, and it just wasn't a marketable grape. Um, you know, in, in, in some ways, it was like a little harder to grow. Uh, prohibition happened and fucked everybody over. Um, you know, there were other grapes that, you know, were, were easier to ship around. Petite Syrah, in particular, um, did really well. It's a grape called Derith, um, because it had these thick skins, and you could send it across the country and, you know, send it to people to make, um, you know, their own sacramental wine. Um, but... Uh, it, it's just an accident of history. It's, it's coming back a little bit. People are starting to work with it, but um, there's just not a lot of it um, stateside and certainly even less of it as a, a single varietal wine. So it doesn't really have, I, I can't think of an American champion. Um, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong uh, among the chatters of, of, of Malbec as a single varietal entity. I, I wish there were because it actually like does pretty well in cool, even cooler climates, but um, you know, I, I can't think of one. 
that Walsh family wine that we had, that was a Malbec, wasn't it? That one that we had out of barrel? Oh, it could be. Yeah, it, it could be. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. They certainly work with Tanat. Um, um, so, you know, I, I think people are, I think the fun thing again about, you know, the, the you know, latest generation of wine consumers is, you know, they're less invested in, um, you know, uh, what they can mass market and more invested in, you know, what strikes their fancy. And, and, and you know, hopefully people will taste more wines like this and, and see a place for Malbec in that pantheon. Um, so for the sake of this other wine, I wanted to bring this to the mix because this is uh, from the family Zicardi um, and uh, they are in the Uco Valley as well. And this speaks to um, kind of a, a very different, um, you know, kind of uh, wine making uh, bit of esoterica, which is the role that vessels have to play um, in winemaking. So uh, this wine is called uh, Concreto. Um, it is available on our uh, wine store, shameless plug. Uh, it is fermented in these alien-like vessels. Uh, so these are concrete eggs. Um, and concrete has much to recommend it um, as a vessel for fermentation. Um, uh, you know, typically, you know, there's this, you know, kind of A or B um, paradigm for the sake of how do we ferment and age our wines. You know, it's either stainless steel tanks or it's oak vessels. Um, stainless steel is inert, so it imparts no flavor, uh, but it is not oxygen transmissive at all. It's also not great uh, as an insulator. Um, oak, uh, a little better as an insulator, although, you know, certainly not great. Um, uh, it imparts its own flavors, the newer it is, uh, but it is very oxygen transmissive. Um, and that can be useful for a grape like Malbec, um, because that oxygen influence softens some of the acidity and, and can soften some of the tannins. Concrete is this third way, somewhere in between. Uh, so it imparts no oak flavors, but it is more oxygen transmissive than um, stainless steel. And then it has this great moderating influence for the temperature of the wine during fermentation. And then on top of that, these womb-like eggs that look like something from uh, you know, the alien movies, it's a little horrifying, um, but you get this great circulation of the wine during fermentation, and that keeps the fine lees suspended, and it gives the wine an amazing texture and mouthfeel that you wouldn't come by otherwise. Concrete itself is also a little bit alkaline, so it tends to dampen some of the acidity in high acid uh, grapes and give the wine itself uh, more breadth uh, on the mouthfeel. And uh, there are a lot of winemakers in um, in Argentina who are hugely passionate um, uh, devotees of concrete uh, as their primary fermentation and aging vessel. And um, both the Zorzal uh, and the wine I'm drinking, Concreto, um, from the Zuccardi family um, are aged entirely concrete. And Zuccardi's super cool. So um, a third generation winemaker here, he's dreamy. Um, he's like a bit of an Argentine uh, love boat who, you know, is tremendously skilled and uh, more handsome than, you know, he should be. Um, at any rate, he went in a very different direction from his father and his grandfather, who was a, a famous engineer who actually um, outfitted a lot of wineries with irrigation uh, canals. Um, and, and he said that um, he wanted to move the wines in a, um, you know, kind of uh, softer, you know, less heavy-handed, less oaky direction. And, um, you know, it's not necessarily something that his father would have done himself, but there is this, you know, kind of, uh, you know, embrace of uh, change um, in Argentina. And again, I think it speaks to the fact that you're dealing with a newer region and, and people are just more likely to, um, you know, from one generation to another empower um, the, the youth. And, and it's super cool. And, and there are a lot of really awesome women, um, you know, making wine and um, affecting change. Um, uh, in Argentine cellars, uh, Catena, Zapin, uh, Catena Zapata in particular. Um, uh, there's a, a wine school associated with UC Davis um, that they operate, you know, that's all about understanding, you know, how fermentations occur um, at higher altitudes, you know, what is um, particularly special about Malbec in Argentina. Um, so they really become this driver of innovation um, in wine, not only in their small corner of the world in South America, but globally. Um, in a way that, you know, transcends, um, you know, this place that they once had as a historical author in. And I think that's totally worth celebrating. Um, and, and what concrete gives for me is, um, you know, ageability. You know, you get something that has this purity, but also has, um, you know, 
uh, grip structure, I, I find very often you get a little more of, of a dimension of, of tannin in, in concrete aged wine, uh, but you get, you know, um, apparently higher acid, whether or not the pH is, is higher or lower. Um, but everything feels more integrated. Um, the fermentations tend to take longer uh, because the, the temperature is moderated, um, but everything just feels more cohesive in, in a really, you know, kind of profound um, uh, way. Um, and, and I like that about the wines. And, and this one in particular is like hugely floral and it's changed a lot, even in the course of our class. Um, when I first opened it, it was a little tight, um, but it's come into its own really beautifully and has all this like kind of violet uh, floral thing uh, happening now. So uh, I'm gonna read one more overwrought uh, quote for you all here um, and we'll toast and then we can close out with questions. Uh, thank you as always for joining us on this gorgeous day. But um, this is again, Pablo Lacoste, he says, so Malbec was given the opportunity to rediscover his old friends, those whose companionship he had cultivated in the Middle Ages, in the times of Queen Eleanor and the Templars, or the peasants and kings of modernity, Henry IV, Francis I of France, Peter the Great of Russia, Catherine. It was a reunion of centuries. In a way, those characters from history and legend come back to life every day in each glass. Before I could see it coming from the side. Cheers to that. Uh, as always, uh, to you all, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for um, staying safe at home with us. Um, we are alone together. Cheers. That's wunderbar. Um, Thompson, what do you got for us? Uh, you're muted. Did I mute you? No? No, no, I'm good. I'm here. I'm back. Uh, your hair, your hair is fierce today. For for the record, Thompson, you're looking you're looking great. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's what I get when I wear my delivery hat during the day. Nice, nice. It's a good look for you. Thanks. Um, I don't know that you know people are people are just chatting right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, Should we leave the chat live and just <laughs> just <laughs> able to talk to each other about this? <laughs> Want to talk about bugs again? Yeah, I know. I know. Um, <laughs> I don't want to potentially offend any pug owners in the, in the audience. <laughs> uh, um, people actually do, people do want to know, that's a great point, um, <laughs> what your general pairings would be and which of these wines you would choose to go with steak. I think all of them. Uh, um, actually, I will say, so fascinatingly, so we're dealing with like 12.5% alcohol on the cohort. But for me, it's like the bloodiest of the bunch. Um, and, and also like, you know, steak is not, you know, we're dealing with an animal with a lot of different cuts. So, you know, what, what's my cut of steak, you know? Is this, you know, a leaner cut? Is it fattier cut? Um, but I, I, I want something, you know, core. I feel like the tannins are a little coarser, but um, I'd be happy to drink all of these with steak. Um, you know, some kind of, you know, chimichurri sauce situation just feels right with the Argentine ones. And I feel like, you know, the, the marriage of those flavors, the herbal sauce steak with Malbec just feels really perfect because it's a wine that when it's done well, has these big leafy herbal kind of tonalities. And, and I, I love that. I live for that, you know, um, you know, if you're not a vegetarian, you're not, or if you're, you know, you live for that, but like it, you know, it feels very, it feels very organic um in in a really awesome way um people you you did actually open up um a world of questions about the concrete egg situation and yeah. people want to know how big they are and how yeah. long generally people age them in traditionally yeah. from what i've seen they're about six feet tall when you yeah say so tall. they're um it depends on the egg i, I want to say that um you know they're they'd be they'd be more like demi mood size so they'd be like um, you know, 500, 2000 liters at least. Um, and, uh, they're, they're more, it's, it's fascinating. So like they're more expensive than stainless. They're less expensive than constantly buying oak. And they're obviously like more sustainable than constantly buying oak. Um, they're sometimes less practical for wineries because obviously you can't easily move them. Um, they're actually kind of finicky to clean. Um, you can't um, use hot water to clean them because, um, especially if they have metal fittings, because the concrete can expand and crack. They're not lined, right? No, no, exactly. Um, so you have to be really careful about how you clean them. 
Um, there, are, but that said, um, you know, once you kind of work with them enough and get used to their idiosyncrasies, they're, they're ageless. Um, you can age wine in them as long as you want. The other benefit they have is um, they keep the, so when you're making red wine, um, you, you are worried a lot about um, what's called cap maintenance. So you're, you have um, the juice, obviously, and then you have the cap, which is all the stems, or if you're using stems, but uh, skins and seeds that floats to the top during fermentation through the uh, percolating action of CO2. And um, how you manage that cap is really important to how you basically infuse your wine that is a tea with all the flavors that those skins have. What's cool about the eggs is that they um, keep the cap submerged with a smaller surface area at the top, which is kind of like what you're going for in, in cap maintenance in the best possible way. Actually, these guys in Cahor Thompson, they, um, they top off in their cement vats after primary so that they have a layer of juice above the cap in the tanks that stays through malolactic, which doesn't occur until the following spring. So they submerge the whole thing under this thin, it's madness. But anyway, that's really- that's that's, the end product. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, so it should be said, so this, we're getting very nerdy and I hope we're not losing too many participants here. Um, this is more of a conversation between Sarah and I than with the rest of the group. But at any rate, um, uh, uh, so wine develops its astringency through the action of, of, of tannins, which are these like long chain polyphenols. Um, and uh, it is the case though that um, counterintuitively, if you give wine more contact with the skins, the tannins tend to soften and they tend to be resorbed into the grape skins such as they are there. Um, and so I like a lot of red wines that have cartoonishly long um, skin contacts. The problem with that is in a workaday wine context, it can be hard to maintain that uh, a regime without spoiling the wine. So uh, the longer you do that, the more you invite, um, you know, uh, malfeasance from these biological actors. But uh, concrete kind of does that for you uh, in, in a cool way. Um, and it, it's, it can be expensive, but it's also like, it can be a local material. Um, you know, there are a lot of different uh, people that are like selling boutique concrete eggs um, that are super expensive, but it is very much in vogue as a fermentation vessel. And people are like hugely invested in the shape. The egg-like thing is trending. It feels very goopy. It feels very Gwyneth Paltrow in a way that I don't know if I'm entirely comfortable with. But um, there is something to the, um, the circulation during fermentation. Like that's, that is, there is a scientific basis for that above and beyond whatever Gwyneth is about for the sake of her wines. I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> I got to mention goop. So, so hashtag goop. So if we have any, yeah, yeah. You went with it. You ran with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> there's still more questions about concrete eggs, but there was this other wine that you mentioned in your email that was a great steak wine that you haven't talked about at all, and people want to know what it was. Well, there's a Finca uh, uh, Alagisa. Yeah. That. That, so that's um, from cartoonishly old vines. Those are over a century old. Um, and uh, yeah, that, it's, it's special. Um, and I, I think like uh, that's something that younger winemakers in Argentina are also kind of exploring is, is this wealth of history that they have there. So there is, there's a lot of old vine material. Um, it might be from unlikely grapes. It might be from like, it's not going to be in Uco Valley. It's going to be in... Um, you know, um, Maipo or, or, or elsewhere in Mendoza, but there are 100 plus year old vines, just like there are really old vineyards in California. And in, in the old vineyards in California, they're not, a, they're not a Napa, they're, you know, closer to Lodi, they're closer to the Central Valley. Um, and, you know, people are playing with that. Th this particular wine um, is, uh, I, I, I actually haven't tasted it, I, I meant to bring a bottle home, uh, but, uh, uh, we get it from uh, Joffrey, who's a, a friend of the pod. Um, and, you know, it, you develop these relationships as a wine buyer with, with uh, the people you buy wine from. And it, it's a different than, like, um, a typical 
you know, kind of like salesman buyer relationship. It's a little more like kind of simpatico, like, you know, we're, you know, brothers in arms for the sake of, you know, intellectual inebriation. And uh, uh, Joffrey uh, said that, you know, this is like the, you know, shit, this is like the greatest Argentine mob I've ever had. Um, and, and I also have this like huge soft spot for, um, like these new world wines that are kind of like old school new world in the sense that like, they don't taste like anything that could come out of the old world. And cause they're like sappy and ripe, but they're also like elegant and multifaceted and awesome. And, and I think the Finca has that. Um, and, and the other thing too, is that like, you're dealing with something that, you know, with those old vines, with the history that it has, you know, it's not inexpensive, you know, you're talking, you know, $60 that you're throwing down for a uh, wine. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to pretend that's within everyone's means, you know, but by the same token, like if it was from, you know, Margot or Saint Estef or Chateauneuf or wherever, like it would be $160, not $60. Um, and, and I think that's, that's worth celebrating in and of its own right. I have a really important question for you. Go. So you have three options for what your next career path will be based on the chat. Okay. Um, you can author a book with John. Cyber? Yep. No, you can no, no, no. Start a winery. <laughs> wait, you have to wait until you hear all the options. <laughs> you can start uh, a winery. Uh, don't, don't, people, don't, people are wondering whether you've made wine before. And then three, I'm not, I'm not, three, 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 are you going to start a tour company for all of the wineries and all the places that we've talked about thus far and let everybody go with you? Um, that sounds like the most entertaining and the most lucrative. So naturally, I'm probably going to do number two. Um, and, <laughs> and and start a winery. I would wine. like you to do all three. I know, I know. I've not I've not made wine before. Um, I aspire to eventually make wine. I feel like I don't know enough. Um, uh, you know, I think that you know, there's a very there are like different perspectives in in the wine trade. There there is you know the consumer perspective. There there is my perspective, which is more about the breadth of wine than it is like the singular depth of making a wine from you know, vineyard to glass. Um, I, I really prejudice the, um, the winemaker um, uh, perspective. Um, I mean, I, I could make a wine, I don't know if it'd be any good, um, but um, you know, I, I'll get there. I, I, I have no doubt that I'll get there eventually. I know enough people in the Finger Lakes at this point um, for the sake of sourcing fruit that, um, you know, there'll be a, it, it won't be Cuvée Bill Jensen, you know, that's a terrible name. Uh, it'll be, um, you know, wildly, uh, imaginative and digressive for the sake of the name, but, um, you know, that will exist at some point, um, as opposed to touring, um, I'll be satisfied when I can leave my zip code, let alone, <laughs> you know, <laughs> let, let alone, you know, hosting wine tours abroad. But I think, I do thank the commentary for the sake of, uh, the, the suggestion. Um, my, honestly, like, I hope that like, uh, you know, some talent scout from Hulu is watching as we speak and it's like, we got to send this motherfucker to insert wine region here because that shit's going to be entertaining. Um, uh, but I, I don't know if that'll happen. Yet, so we've got to know people. Yeah, I know. Happen. I think it can happen. Um, do you know, I, I don't know. I, I can go back to asking you more questions about concrete eggs, but I like the concrete egg is such a, uh, what, what is, what were the other questions about concrete eggs? Well, people want to know where it's used in the U S a lot of a lot of a lot of more suit um so so but jim Watt has one yeah. he doesn't he doesn't know what to do with it, it <laughs> he hates it it kind of pisses me off uh um and it's more of a, it was more like that's more like a like a jim drunkenly like took a flyer on something as opposed to like a conscious decision to work with concrete egg um it's a really good question i can't think of um actually the so fascinatingly enough the people at cake bread um, that made uh, concrete egg a big part of the Chardonnay production. Uh, Chardonnay does really well in, in, in concrete. Some some grapes work better in it than others, um, uh, but Chardonnay does really well in concrete, and they they played with it a lot, um, uh, which kind of defies I think people's expectation of what that wine would be. Um, I, there are a lot of more astute, um, you know, kind of younger winemakers. There's a bit of a there's a financial barrier um, in terms of buying the eggs. Um, and there are alternatives too. like there, are, there are some like egg shaped vessels that aren't expensive as concrete that you kind of get some of the same use out of. 
um, but you can actually like lift them and it's, it's actually like concrete. The other thing too is like it's, it's aesthetic. They look kind of cool if you're into that whole like alien, you know, um, egg aesthetic. Like I think, but they're, they're, they are kind of impractical because you have to empty. So like we talked about the cap, but like you have to, you have to separate after you, you kind of like ferment a, a red, you have to separate that free run juice from the cap, which you then press, which is your press juice. And good winemakers will keep those separate. They, they do here. Um, I don't know what they do here. But anyway, um, uh, and, and logistically, that's a lot harder if you have this concrete, like, thing that you can't move at all. Um, so I, I, I don't know. Like, it, the, the coolest thing about it for me is the heat retention. So, like, the fact that, like, it – is a buffer so you know for the sake of um you know wines that you want to keep colder it keeps them colder for the sake of red ferments it's actually about um you know moderating the extremes of temperature um so it won't get quite as hot but it also won't get quite as cold it's, it's like a you know um it's a goldilocksy and, and and wines in their gestation tend to be kind of goldilocksy um uh and and i think like a lot of winemakers do find that that vessel you know, the, the fermentations in particular, even more so than the aging, um, is, is like, you know, just more, um, it's more elegant, like better. Um, so. Donkey and goat uses it. Oh, nice. This is concrete eggs. I'm trying to go through the chat right now and see if there are any other questions. All right. Well, I think we're shedding, we're shedding people. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces in the mix. Uh, Heidi, love you. Yoda Gunn, <laughs> great to see you, sir. Um, thank you guys uh, for hanging out this long. Uh, get outside, please, uh, if you're in the DMV, enjoy the weather. What do you got, Thompson? Will you just go briefly over what you did at the beginning of the class, what we're donating on Thursday and about... Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so once more, um, if you are in the DMV and in your position to, um, you know, purchase anything from us, uh, this Thursday at Tailup Goat, um, all orders placed for pickup and delivery at Tailup Goat on Thursday. Um, uh, the uh, bulk of the proceeds, uh, all the, um, uh, everything for the sake of your food purchases, everything after our costs for the sake of, of beverage purchases, uh, will uh, go to Campaign Zero, um, which is an outgrowth of the Black Lives Matters movement, but um, uh, specifically um, uh, kind of like tailored to uh, recommendations for uh, reforming uh, police practices on the ground uh, so that, um, you know, there are zero lives lost to uh, overly aggressive um, police action. Um, and then uh, across the Revelers Hour, um, bulk of goods, all sandwich sales uh, will go to Campaign Zero um, as, as well. Um, and, you know, it's what little we can do. And um, again, you know, I, I think, you know, we're hugely proud of uh, the folks that um, we, we have worked with um, that have been, you know, on the ground this week and uh, have been visible actors on the ground uh, for the sake of this, of this movement. And, you know, we want to, um, you know, take action for our own part. And for people who are outside the D.C. area, do you just recommend donating directly to Campaign yeah, Zero? Yeah please, yeah, please just give to Campaign Zero. Um, there are a lot of really amazing social justice organizations that do work like this. Um, one of my favorite historically has been the sentencing project. Um, it's, it's kind of a different issue than uh, police reform, but that, that is more about, um, you know, uh, uh, criminal justice reform. Um, the ACLU does amazing work um, across the board, both for the sake of um, uh, reforming policing practices and for criminal justice reform as well. Um, but uh, I, th I think, you know, it's easy to, it's easy to feel you know, uh, you know, I, I'm speaking as a cartoonishly, you know, white dude, and I'm not in a position to protest because, you know, I, I, I'm worried about bringing that back um, in terms of pandemic to um, our workplace, but it's easy to feel powerless. And I, I think at the very least, um, you know, making a financial contribution to, uh, you know, a relevant organization is a really powerful way to do that. Um, and I, I think people underestimate that. Um, and, you know, make your voice heard on, on social media, certainly. But, you know, there are a lot of amazing um, non-governmental organizations and nonprofits that have been, um, you know, doing work um, related to these issues for a long time. And, and I, I will say, I think, you know, sadly, the only thing that has changed with respect to this issue is video. This has been happening, you know, since 
America was founded. The only thing that's changed is that people have cell phones. Um, and I think that's the most horrifying piece of it. The only thing that's changed is that people can document it. And that because of that, the world is, is taking notice. Um, and I think we all you know, need to remember that and take action accordingly. But uh, that, that's all I had to offer. Um, but at any rate, um, you know, uh, uh, we'll be doing what we can on Thursday. And um, you know, on top of that, if you wanna uh, buy some you know, Tail of Goat or Rebel Sour merch to wear while you, while you protest or while you give, uh, that's, that's available online as well. But uh, at any rate, um, I wanna toast to you guys as well. Um, this is you know, a highlight of my week and uh, I'm grateful um, that you, know, you made it touch. So cheers.